Hi there, welcome to Plains Evangelical Church, Church Online. Glad you could join us as we share God's Word with you today. Turn with me if you've got a Bible to Hebrews chapter 2 and follow along in the passage. If you don't, you can Google it uh, or download one of the various different Bible apps. If you'd like a Bible, you can get in touch with us and we'd love to drop one off at your house or send one out to you. Uh, pastor at plainsevangelicalchurch.com. That's where you can also send any of your questions or comments that you might have. Uh, regarding what's said today. Pastor at plainsevangelicalchurch.com But let's read God's word together in Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. For since the message was declared by the angels proved, proved for since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. How shall we escape if we are to neglect such a great salvation? It was declared first by the Lord, and whom it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witnesses by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by the gift of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now it was not to the angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honour, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present we do not see everything that is in subjection to him, but we see him who is a little, who, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of his death, so that the grace of God might be, so that through the, by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things existed, in bringing many sons to glory, should be made the founder of salvation, perfecting it through his suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call him brothers, saying, I will tell you of your I will tell you of your of your name to my brothers, and in the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children of God. Behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children who share the flesh and blood, he himself is like, likewise partook in the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power over death, that is, the devil, and deliver those who fear death, who were subjected to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not the angels that helps, but it is he that helps the offspring of Abraham, and therefore had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become merciful and faithful, and a faithful high priest in the service of God, to make the propitiation for sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered, when he tempted, he is able when, when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. For those who are watching in Scotland, cast your mind back over the summer to the various different COVID roles that we needed to follow. And then it would hit a certain date and all would change and we'd have a new set of rules to follow. You'd go to the shops and you'd be one set of rules. You would go to work and there would be another set of rules on the bus and another set. You would go to church and there would be another set of rules to follow. It just got confusing, didn't it? And then that magic date of August the 9th came. And those many rules were reduced to one, wearing face masks in public places. Now, that's a little bit like the book of Hebrews. It opens with these words in chapter one. On the past occasions, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. The many was reduced to one. Before Jesus God spoke in many ways and then Jesus showed up and God said this is my son listen to him 
Now, you can listen to those other ways. It may well be helpful to listen to those other ways. But Jesus has the final say. He's like the funnel that all these other ways finally end up at. And last time we looked at, began looking at how Jesus is a better revelation of God. Chapter 1 was all about the person of God being revealed through the identity of Jesus. Today we'll look at chapter 2, which is all about the salvation of God revealed through the mission of Jesus. Everyone is looking for some kind of salvation, whether they use that word or not. The means and the ends of salvation, they may vary, but everyone has it inside themselves that they want to find some kind of salvation, whether that's salvation from suffering or salvation to a better life. Jesus' salvation was required following the first sin. Before sin, there was no need for salvation because God's creation was perfect and humanity was satisfied with that which God had given them. And then when humanity ate of the tree that God gave them, that God set in the middle of the garden, that would give them knowledge of anything different than God's perfection, that perfection was then gone. The world became broken, relationships with each other became broken. More importantly, we could no longer have that perfect relationship with God. Sin came into the world and life would one day end in death and eternal suffering. But only just after that happened in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 16, God gave hope. He spoke the first words in the Bible of salvation, that he had a plan to send a saviour into the world that would restore his perfection that existed before the fall. And from then on, throughout the Old Testament, God gave his people a number of religious practices that would atone for their sin. Now those practices on their own didn't do the work of salvation. But in doing them and having faith in a, that promised saviour, who would do the final act of salvation, they could be saved. And that saviour was, of course, Jesus, we read that there in verse 9, namely Jesus. Hebrews, it was originally written to pe those people whose ancestors once lived in the hope of the future coming saviour in Jesus Christ. And they carried out those religious practices along with that faith. And at the time of writing, some people recognised Jesus as saviour. But they didn't understand the fact that Jesus was the fulfilment of all those religious practices. And therefore, you didn't need to do many of them because Jesus done them once for all. Now for us today, we read Hebrews from a slightly different perspective than the original readers. But we need to still hear that same message. That Jesus is better. That his salvation is better. That any salvation that doesn't look to Jesus' salvation is pointless. Our view of salvation might have been skewed by church traditions or wrongful teachings. We might view salvation today through our culture and through what the world is wrongly telling us. So we need to read Hebrews and be reminded that Jesus' salvation is not just a better salvation, but it is in fact the only salvation. The only salvation that we can trust in. So let's do that as we look at the text in Hebrews chapter 2 and think about Jesus being the better, better revelation of God's salvation. First of all, let's ask the question, why Jesus' salvation? A good salesperson will have to give reasons on why his product is better than anything else on the market. It's the job of Christians to sell, if I can use that word carefully, Christ's free gift of salvation to unbelievers and to show how that it's not just the best salvation but it is in fact the only salvation. So it begins with the word therefore. Now anytime we see the word therefore in the Bible we should ask ourselves what is the therefore therefore? And this therefore joins up what has just been said in chapter 1 about what God, uh, about um, who God is to what is about to be said in chapter 2. So the first reason that we should respond to Jesus' salvation and trust in it is because of who he is. That he is the perfect representation of the perfect God. 
No other power possesses such a character that we read of in chapter one last time. And this is the reason why we should pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away, as it, chapter two opens up by saying. Now, this means different things to different people. For those who haven't accepted Jesus' salvation after hearing it, there's a warning that one day your heart will be, become hard and that you will drift away from that message. You know, the, the things that you learned as a child in school and, and that you didn't remember throughout your life, you've drifted away from them. You don't remember them. You see your children learning about them and think, oh my goodness, one day I knew all that, but now I don't. Well, that's what it's like when you drift away from the message of salvation after hearing it. Later on in Hebrews chapter 3, we read, Today if, you harden you, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you harden your hearts, if you ignore the message, then one day you will drift away. To harden your heart is to reject the free gift of Jesus' salvation. Those who do so, we're told, will be unable to enter heaven. So today, you have heard the message. Throughout this message, you will have heard the message of God's salvation. So don't harden your hearts when you walk away from this place. But for those who have accepted the message of Jesus' salvation, there is also a word for us here. It isn't saying that if you neglect the message of Jesus, you'll lose your salvation. Salvation is not yours to lose in the first place. The Bible says salvation is of the Lord's. It is saying that salvation is not just for conversion. It's not just for the moment in which you become a Christian, when you pray that, sinner, pray that sinner's prayer. It's for the whole of the Christian life. You have been saved from sin's penalty. You are being saved from sin's power. One day you will be saved from sin's presence. It's a past, present and future salvation. If we neglect any part of that salvation, if we drift away from it, we will find ourselves becoming increasingly under the power of sin. In Hebrews chapter 2, we have two places that was accepted by the original readers that give evidence for the need of salvation. The first is in history. Once again, the writer references the message declared by the angels. And in its simplest form, angels were the divine messengers of God. In other words, they spoke God's words. Hebrew belief was that God historically sent messengers called angels to speak to leaders and kings and prophets. They would then relay that message to the people. So it was the Bible before the Bible came into existence. The Hebrews trusted in the message that came from the angels, from God, and they built their faith on that. The message that they spoke was true, and real life stories supported it. In particular, Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews draws their attention towards the stories of judgment, the judgment of sin. Now there are many stories in the Old Testament that speaks of God's judgment on sin. Probably the most famous, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, closely followed by the story of Lot's wife, Pharaoh and the ten plagues, the forty years of wandering in the wilderness, King Solomon and the downfall of Israel, just to name a few. The message of the need of God's salvation was demonstrated in history when people ignored the word of God and they were judged for their sin. Salvation wasn't just from the fall and sin and everything that came into the world because of it. Salvation also came from God's righteous judgment because sin needs to be judged and punished. So if you want to test salvation's message in this world, look at what it achieves. Or rather, look at what, look at who accepts it. Or rather, look at who fail to accept it, who reject it. To this day, history, our own recent history, has proved that ignoring God's salvation, it only creates chaos. Ignorance to God's salvation will only lead to suffering, to sin, and ultimately to death and judgment. God's salvation it is reliable. You have nothing to lose by accepting it, but you have everything to lose by rejecting it. We don't 
sell salvation to the unbeliever by painting them a picture of what heaven looks like. That would probably put the unbeliever off salvation. But we do demonstrate the need for salvation through showing people how God will one day judge them in their sin. Another way that the people in the days of the Hebrews accepted the need for salvation was based on the recent testimonies of their fellow Hebrews. Sometimes at Christian meetings we have what's called a testimony. Someone giving their salvation story. The writer tells us that salvation was first spoke to the church, first spoke to Christians by the Lord Jesus. He then goes on to say that it was confirmed by those who heard. So those who didn't harden their heart, those who responded. Now, the book of Hebrews was written 40 years after Jesus walked the earth. So we'll now be on to second generation Christians. Many of the readers never saw Jesus in real life. The written gospel accounts, they weren't widely available. So people were dependent on the word of mouth, on the testimony of other believers. They would preach God's word, first spoken by Jesus, and then they would back it up with their own personal experience of salvation. Their lives were a living example, giving further weight to those historical accounts that Jesus' salvation was better. When you're living out the salvation of Jesus, your life noticeably changes. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the suffering will always be reduced and you'll no longer sin. But your ability to resist sin and endure suffering is given a supernatural power. Something that, without salvation, wouldn't be possible. So by telling your story of how God's salvation has affected your life, Jesus' story therefore becomes real and not just a historical event that happened in the past. In addition to human preaching and testimony, we also have, in verse 4, the divine testimony of God. We read that God bears witness with them, with those giving their verbal testimonies, by signs, wonders and various miracles. Now, the greatest miracle that God ever did was in raising Jesus from the dead. And he'll do that same miracle for all who trust in Jesus' salvation. But we're told in scripture that God does other miracles too, as a demonstration of his salvation. So he'll do things like transform the life of a drug addict. He'll do things like, not always, but sometimes, heal the patient who has cancer. He'll intervene in our lives in ways that we can't explain. He'll save us from harm. He'll give us possessions in a way that only he can. Hebrews 2 verse 4 then continues, saying that God gives us gifts through the Holy Spirit according to his will. So when you trust in Jesus' salvation, you'll find yourself able to do things that in not trusting in him, you cannot do. Many people fall short of accepting God's salvation because they look at the life of a Christian today and they think, I can't do that. I can't be like a Billy Graham. I can't be like somebody who has done great things for God. But it's only in trusting in God's salvation, not just at conversion, but throughout our lives, that we can do some of these things. That doesn't mean to say that God will call us all to be like somebody like Billy Graham or some other famous Christian. He's got something for you, something that only you can do. And he'll give you the strength and the ability to do it. In the next section, we read that it's only in tr- uh, that the, ri- the writer tells us that God's salvation. In the next section, the writer tells us about the salvation that we should accept. What is Jesus' salvation? And he again continues in the theme of angels as divine messengers from God. Again, like chapter one, he uses Old Testament verses to emphasise his points. The first point that he makes is how salvation is revealed. Now, people often say that if God is omnipotent, if he can do all things, then why didn't God prevent the fall? Or why did God create a world that could not sin? Why did he give us a choice? Now, whilst this is an idealistic suggestion, 
it prevents us from seeing some of the greatest works of God. See, the character of God can be seen clearest through the lens of salvation. If we were perfect creations, then we could, although we shouldn't, argue that we're deserving of God's blessings. So there's no big thing in him giving it to us. But to receive God's blessings through Christ's salvation, as sinners who deserve nothing but judgment and death, it becomes much more of an amazing work of God, and one in which we should give him all the praise and all the glory that he's due. Again, Hebrews compares us to the angels. He says in verse 7 that he made us lower than the angels. Now, we could read this and interpret it in such a way that we envy the angels, that the angels are created beings existing higher than us, that they are more privileged position, they're not affected by sin, they live in the perfect presence of God, they don't fight against each other, and when they do, they get thrown out of heaven. Now, that's the glass is half empty view of comparing mankind to angels. The glass is half full view is that in existing lower than the angels, yes, we can ex- we experience sin and all the suffering that comes by living in a broken world. But we can also experience something that the angels never will. God's salvation. So to come from the pit of sin and death to a position we're told will one day be greater than the angels, we experience so much more of the character of God. And we experience the blessings of God that the angels or any other part of God's creation never will. The next thing that we're told is that salvation is restricted. Before we get carried away with what salvation brings, the second half of verse 8 gives us a reality check. It reminds us that for just a little while, we are lower than the angels. And therefore, our revelation of God is lower than their revelation of God. But for a t- but it is time restricted. We are saved, but our salvation that we experience today is restricted. Our present salvation, it's not moved us away from the presence of sin. As we live throughout our lives, we do battle with the presence of sin. So some things we're able to overcome, but some things will always be there. For example, our bodies will always get older and one will one day die. Our health will fluctuate. One minute we'll be healthy and the next minute we'll be not. We'll get injured. Various different things will happen whilst we are on this earth. We go on suffering under sin and its effects. We ourselves sin, others sin against us. And we endure the effects of a broken and suffering world. So our full salvation, our salvation free from sin, it's secure, it's guaranteed. When you trust in Jesus, you will always have that salvation. We don't need to repeat the process of conversion. We don't need to worry about it getting lost. The Bible says that the power of the Holy Spirit and the lives of believers is proof of our salvation. But we haven't taken hold of it in its completed form. We're not yet free from sin's presence. We've saved, been saved from sin's penalty. We are being saved from sin's power, but not yet saved from sin's presence. So we need to depend on the strength that comes from God through his Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit helps us to resist the temptations of sin. That the Holy Spirit empowers us to forgive those who sin against us. That the Holy Spirit gives us the endurance to live through and to to rely on God through the suffering of sin in this broken world. See, the problem is for many believers who become Christians, they don't know how to do this. So they might respond to an invitation and pray a prayer, assume a title, become a Christian, and then when troubling, when the troubles of living in a sinful world comes, they wonder what it's all for. Was it really worth it? And that's because they've had a misrepresentation of what the Christian life is. We do not receive salvation merely at the point of praying the sinner's prayer unless at the same time and from that time on we see the one who has bought our salvation. 
the one who recovered our salvation. And that's what we look at next, salvation recovered. When mankind first sinned and the world became broken, they did not have any means of salvation. They didn't have a get out of sin free card. No amount of prayers or religious duties or good deeds alone could save them. And the same is true for us today. Salvation is not by our works. It's only by the works of Jesus. Jesus recovered our salvation and Jesus then offered it to us as a free gift. This goes back to what we saw last time when we looked at the character of Jesus. And then in addition, in verses 2 and 9, we read that God put everything in subjection to him. Salvation, which belongs to the Lord, was given to Jesus. He was given full control of it because nothing is outside his control. He is in control of its recovery and he is in control of its distribution. In its recovery, he was too made lower than the angels, showing the ultimate example of humanity. Think about it. If Jesus is over all things and we are lower than the angels, then for Jesus to make that trip, he has a lot further to go. We're told that Jesus tasted death for, death for everyone. So before Jesus was crowned over everything, he first of all had to remove the curse from everyone. He wore a crown of thorns before he put on the crown of glory and honour. And he did so to recover our salvation. So we should not be ashamed of ourselves if we ever think, sorry, we should be ashamed of ourselves if we ever think that we can do anything for God. Because only Jesus can do the one thing that he requires of us. He humbled himself from creator to criminal. He died in our place for our sin. He rose again three days later, showing that only he has the power of salvation. We can do these acts of service. We can worship in response to Jesus' salvation, but we cannot do the act of salvation. Only Jesus can do that. Only he, as verse 10 tells us, is the founder of our salvation. But after recovering salvation, we're told that Jesus also offered salvation. Verse 9 says it was offered to everyone. So the idea that Jesus' work on the cross was restricted for just a few, it belittles his generosity and love. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus was given for the world. But not everyone will be saved. Verse 10 says that he will bring many sons, many children, to glory, but not all. This is because many will reject salvation. Everyone can be saved, but not everyone will be saved because many will harden their hearts. Many will reject Jesus' salvation and therefore endure God's judgment. To reject such an amazing free gift is one of the worst things that we can do. But the power of salvation It's there for those who, verse 13, put their trust in him. Jesus never called his followers his children before he went to the cross. He called them his disciples before that. It is only through the power of the cross that we become children of God. And as we saw last time, inherit all the blessings that God gave to Jesus and Jesus in turn gives to us. The writer uses the word in verse 17, propitiation to describe how what makes all this possible. It means that Jesus has done everything necessary to make us children of God. That the judgment of God the judgment of God against sin and death is gone. That sin has been atoned for. That the work of salvation is finished. The gift is wrapped. It just needs to be received. So for some people today You need to do that for the first time. You need to trust in the God of salvation who suffered and was tempted just like you and I are, but who satisfied God's judgment and atones for your sin. For others, you need to recognise that the same God who saved you when you first trusted in him is still saving you today and will one day save you from death into eternal life. We're still being tempted by sin. 
but we have a God who, verse 18 says, helps those who are being tempted, who can forgive us when we fall, who can pick us up, that we might walk in his footsteps until the moment when we see him face to face. Thanks for listening. We hope you can return next week as we look at Hebrews chapter 3.